<laughs> Good morning. First, I just have a quick reminder. Can everybody please um, look at your cell phones and make sure that your ringtones are off and all of those beeps and dings and chirps from your notifications? Thank you. I am Joan Harview, and on behalf of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra League, welcome to our fifth and final sound bites of the year. Hasn't this year gone by quickly? Um, the League hosts these events for the benefit of you, our concert goers. And I want to take this time to thank all of you for joining us on these Fridays. It's your interest in the program and your participation that makes it successful and as well as enjoyable. Thank you all for being here. And you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our music director, who takes the time to put together the content <coughs> excuse me, for each sound bites, along with his guest artist, educates us about the program, the composers, and the context of the pieces that we will be hearing this weekend. Thank you, William. And before we hear about the upcoming performances, Transcending Boundaries, I have one more thing. In case you weren't reminded on your way in, our geranium sale is currently still underway, and you have another one and a half weeks to submit your orders. Surely there is someone you know who would love to have a geranium plant or two, just in time for Mother's Day or just because it's spring. Um, there are forms available at your tables, and Kathy, the, with the headdress on. So thank you again for joining us today, and we will see you back here in six months uh, at our next Sound Bites. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce our music director and our maestro, William and Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, right. Thank you so much, Joan, and thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you, and thank you for joining us for our Unfortunately, our last uh, sound bites of the season, but uh, it's been a great season. It's been the orchestra's 65th anniversary, and that's a milestone to celebrate and be proud of. Uh, it's you know really because of uh, supporters like you that the orchestra continues to thrive and has been part of this community for so long. I was also just reminded that the orchestra has you know, very long roots in this community, even beyond 65 years, because there was a hiatus there around World War II, and then it didn't come back until the 50s. But, you know, from looking at old Telegraph Herald articles, we see that there is a Dubuque Civic Symphony mentioned uh, giving regular concerts from the late 1800s, early 1900s on. So this orchestra and the appreciation of its music has been a huge part of this community for really over 100 years. But we're still celebrating the 65th anniversary, and it's a special opportunity to do it. And one of the things that we um, are, in a way, sort of celebrating is how far we've come. And um, one of the great ways to show that is with a program like we have this weekend. Um, this weekend's program with a wonderful guest artist, Terry Tam, performing the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, and then the Dubuque Symphony performing Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. Uh, I can't think of a better way to show the, the full range and also virtuosity and power of this orchestra and was such a fantastic guest artist. I'd like to just take a moment to thank a couple people who are helping to make this concert possible. Uh, we have representatives from Midwest One, which is our uh, exclusive concert and guest artist sponsor, and we have Dan and Wayne here. Thank you so much for representing the bank and for Midwest One continuous support. As I was saying, they uh, have been, from the very beginning, our earliest ever sponsor, and, um, and we really appreciate the ongoing support for, I believe it's maybe over 40 years, so thank you. And we are so grateful to Tim and Christine Conlon for being our guest artist sponsors. And like Midwest One, um, Tim and Christine were our first ever guest artist sponsors back in the day. And I remember distinctly it was to bring in the pianist Nava Perlman. That was so special way back when. Um, now we have guest artist sponsors on each of our classics. But Tim and Christine were our very first. And they've been with us ever since. It means so much. So thank you. And Christine Conlon is here. Thank you. I'm also grateful for a gentleman named Eugene Bells who brought Terry and his wife Lorraine to my attention and has helped make their appearance possible. Gene is here with us today. Thank you, Gene. We appreciate that. 
I know so many of you have participated in helping the orchestra in a variety of ways, not just by coming to our concerts. Many of you are board members or league board members or former board or league board members and volunteers in many other ways. And we're grateful to all of you for your leadership in bringing us, again, to this milestone. I thought it would be lovely to invite our current board president, Marianne Weber, to just say a few words as she reflects on this 65th anniversary. Marianne. Thank you, William. Thank you for all of your support coming out here, not only to our sound bites, um, also to our concerts. It is because of you that we exist, right? It's because of the music lovers and the community that we create together, experiencing live performance and what connects us beyond what in our world today sometimes divides us. So I think it's a very special gift that we give to ourselves and each other when we do come together to hear this amazing music. Um, I have to thank Joan and our league, amazing partners with the symphony. I also like to say that our staff at the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra are small and mighty. Um, we, the staff and our orchestra, provide an outsized quality experience to a city of our size. So I'd just join me in thanking them for all that they do. And finally, I will just say thank you for all the ways in which you support us. Um, thank you for your contributions to our fundraising efforts. Thank you for the contributions to the league, the beautiful opportunity to order your geraniums for your porch pots uh, this summer. And thank you for particularly your contributions by coming to our concerts and creating the amazing energy that we experience every time we're in the hall. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And next year we get to celebrate William's 25th anniversary with the symphony. So another wonderful year ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Ann. Very great to have you up here. Um, as you know, we've been in a, in a process of searching for a new concert master. Our lead violinist is such an important position in the orchestra. That person not only makes important decisions about the string playing, the particular kinds of bowings they do, but really is a kind of person to set the tone for the orchestra, to inspire the rest of the orchestra musicians. And over the course of this season, we've uh, had an opportunity to introduce here at Soundbite several of our finalists. And this weekend we're working with a, a young man who's playing with us for the very first time. And I have to say, after working with him yesterday at two rehearsals, I am so impressed. So uh, please join me in welcoming Nash Rader. Uh, Nash, tell us, tell us a little bit about your background and, and where you're from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hello, this is, oh, yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Well, first, I want to thank you, William. I want to thank uh, all the members of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra. I want to thank you all for welcoming me here this weekend. It's really such a privilege for me. Um, and getting to work with artists like William, uh, like Terrence, and everyone in the orchestra is, is, is really an inspiration. And it kind of reminds me, you know, what, why I do what I do. So uh, thank you all very much. Um, so believe it or not, yesterday marked my first time ever in Dubuque. Uh, but what a beautiful place, and I feel kind of the special connection because, you know, it's sort of it's on the water, and I was actually born and raised in the state of Maine. Um, not too many of us out here in Iowa. Uh, <laughs> but that's, uh, yes, we're few and far between. But um, so every so uh, there I was in Maine and. Uh, as a young, I think I was seven, or uh, I started violin, and I'd take lessons at the New England Conservatory of Music Prep School in Boston. I'd go down there every Saturday uh, and take, you know, symphony uh, and uh, chamber music and uh, private lessons as well. Uh, and that's when I decided, hey, you know, I kind of like this music thing. I'd like to continue this, and so I continued. I went uh, to Juilliard School in New York City, got a couple degrees there. Um, and it was during this time that I sort of discovered I had two kind of two main passions in life, and that is uh, pedagogy and orchestral playing. 
Um, and so after my time at uh, Juilliard, I went to get my doctorate in violin performance at the Easton School of Music in Rochester, New York, not the, not the other Rochester. Uh, and, um, and then after that, I, uh, I went down to the Miami Beach to play in the New World Symphony. And then, then shortly thereafter, uh, I went from Miami Beach to Cedar Falls, Iowa, which is quite a, a quite a culture shock in, 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 a good, in, in only good ways, <laughs> in great ways. Uh, to be, I'm, I'm the, new, uh, the assistant professor of violin at the University of Northern Iowa, and I've been there since August. And uh, so, uh, but I, I, I love performing. I love uh, love being in an orchestra that experiences like sort of like nothing else. So. Um, I love playing in the communities and, and coming to Dubuque has been an honor really this weekend. Yeah, so. Well, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, do you have any special connections with these pieces? I know you know, you've, you've probably played the Tchaikovsky yourself. I'm sure you've played yes. the Shostakovich before in orchestras, so. Actually, yeah, well, the, the very special connection to Shostakovich, Shosti of course, um, you know, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto is one of the greatest violin concertos of all time. I remember wearing out sort of the CD of Joshua Heifetz playing this. Um, I can't remember who the orchestra was uh, with. So getting to play that uh, and, and listen to Terence play it is really just is so fun. But Shostakovich V, um, that was in many ways my first introduction to 20th century music because I was 13 when I first played this symphony. I played it in the North Shore Community Orchestra in Massachusetts. Um, and I had never, I never really listened to that kind of sound world before. Um, so, but it was like immediately just so gripping and exciting. So, uh, is it that that was? Let's see, how long ago was that? It was about fifteen years ago. I was in the back of the second violins, and now here I am as sort of as concertmaster. So it's a, little, it's a different experience, but it's very exciting. Um, and I think it's, I think it's going to be a really epic program uh, for this weekend. I couldn't be more excited. Thank yeah. you. Well, you're Thanks. a big part of it, and you're it's already making some really important observations and interpretations with me at the rehearsals, and I just appreciate everything that you're bringing to the table so as concert master. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you very Nash. much, William. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we really can't go wrong with this program. We have two fantastic pieces, both of which are audience favorites and really also orchestra favorites, too. Um, so the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto is one that might be familiar to many of us. Um, it's always a special thrill to perform this piece, and it's wonderful to have such an artist like Terry Tam to join us again in this. Um, the last time you were here, I think, it was 2022 with the Brook Violin Concerto, and I was ch saying, well, you probably remember this country club experience from the last time. He was like, I don't think we did this. It was because it was so soon after COVID, we didn't have sound bites that season. So this will be your first chance to really get to know Terry here today. So please join me in welcoming Terry Tam. Yeah. Welcome. Thank so you. I'm sure many of us remember your performance of the Brook Violin Concerto from two years ago. But uh, you know, it's we didn't get this opportunity to visit with you, and there's so much about your life that's fascinating. We know your wife fairly well already because she was here in October. Lorraine Min performed the Greek Piano Concerto for us at the opening of our season. So it's nice to have the husband sort of as bookends of our season. Um, <laughs> So welcome, welcome, and uh, I know it, it takes a while to get to Dubuque from where you live in Canada. Tell us a little bit about that. Where, where are you living now, and where are you from originally? So um, I'm originally, I was born in Canada, uh, born in Toronto, uh, but uh, some, some, uh, some time ago we settled in, um, we're based in Victoria, British Columbia, which is... Um, <laughs> lots of lots yeah. of people who say, "Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, been so, through there on a cruise or something." Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Pacific Northwest, uh, very close to Seattle and Vancouver, but um, it's about as as west as you can get uh, in Canada. It's on the ocean, uh, beautiful place, mountains, ocean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so getting here is a, quite a bit of a. Not only do we are there visas involved, but yeah. also just the flight schedule it's, is it's tricky. It's hard now. to get here. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, because Victoria is a difficult place to get to as right, well, exactly. And, and there's very few direct flights from Victoria anywhere, and, <laughs> and, and, and similarly with the view. Right? Exactly. So, so actually, um, I mean, to to get here in one day is very difficult. Like it takes 
uh, often 12 plus hours of flying time. Yeah. Um, and so I think we did that last time and we decided not to this time. <laughs> so, so you broke it over two days. Right. Yeah. We, we decided to make it a two day trip, stop over in Chicago and, yeah. and uh, it makes it much, much more pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so excited that you came all this way and uh, it's wonderful to work with you again. Um, doing the Brook with you was very special. Also, it was our my first time doing that piece and doing it here as well. Yeah. And you just played it so br brilliantly. And now you're doing the same with the Tchaikovsky. Um, tell us a little bit more about your background. So you, you started violin very young. And you also had an early attachment to this piece, too. Tell us a little bit about sure. that. Yeah. Sure. So, so um, uh, yes, started violin similar to Nash. I, started, uh, I always started at the age of six. Um, and uh, but uh, in our in in our in this track of violin training, um, similar to you know again with 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 Nash, um, the only similarity is he's a lot younger than I am. <laughs> That's not a similarity. So so uh, the, we with the Tchaikovsky Concerto was kind of uh, it's like it's the pinnacle or one of the pinnacles of. The pieces that, that we the concertos that we learn um, as young violinists growing up and and it's it's a very I mean it's kind of one of the end of the road pieces for for violinists it, it's not a certainly not a student piece it's not something that you kind of start young and cut your teeth on you 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 do it when you're ready and and that's usually kind of later in your teens as opposed to earlier in your teens there's always exceptions to that. Um, and but it is a real kind of milestone in, in, in the pieces that we learn. Not, not only because it's such a um, such an amazing concerto and, and uh, again arguably maybe the best violin concerto. One could argue that it's the greatest violin concerto ever written. But it's also one of the most challenging uh, technically uh, uh, concertos for the violin. It's just it's kind of like. A, um, it's an athletic feat to, to do it, and, it, and it's um, uh, it, it's it just drain it, it's draining to play this thing because it's just it just it go it, it I mean it's beautiful, but technically it's just nonstop, and you don't you don't get a break, and it's um, uh, it's I, I say the word athletic, but it really I mean I mean most of us are, are truly tired. You know, even after the first movement, so like you know, there's there's three <laughs> movements, but by the time the first movement's done, I mean it's not just you're not just sweating, but you're you've got kind of lactic acid buildup in your arms. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not a nice feeling. Uh, but but uh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was amazed. Um, you were telling me earlier that you actually did start this, learning this piece when you were still in your teenage years. That, that impressed me. I mean, yeah. I, I have a teenager who's a violinist, and he's not playing the Tchaikovsky yet. <laughs> I mean, my son is uh, is not there yet. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was very excited to 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 finally be, you know, uh, when my teacher kind of allowed me to to start, you know, studying this piece. Uh, I was sixteen or seventeen. And um, and it was a real task to to kind of get. In. We we all knew it. We, you know, we all know it. Growing up, we know it by ear. We've had heard it performed. There's countless recordings that we've listened to. But when you finally get to tackle it and you open the, the music and you see all the notes in front of you and you see what what's coming, um, it's definitely it's kind of a, it gives you a bit of pause. And then and then. Then there comes, so there's the whole issue of, okay, you gotta learn the notes, uh, you know, all the notes on the page, and you try to be faithfully, faithful to everything that's on the page, and you learn, you learn, and then you have to perform it. And that's the thing about this concerto, I personally find is, is maybe the most challenging, is that on stage, this piece is somehow more difficult than what is on the page. And it's hard to kind of express that, but I mean, it, it's kind of like you can see it and you practice it at home, and it's like, oh, this is, this is great. It's written so well and it fits. Um, he had a lot of advice on how to write it for violinists, and, and it, it kind of fits very well. He, he wrote it well for the violinist, so it should be, 
easy, <laughs> but somehow you get on the stage, and this was way back even the very first time I ever performed it as a teen, and everything changed. It was like all of a sudden there's places there where you're just like, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't know this was going to be so difficult because you know the the the, the environment changes and, and actually that pressure of performing somehow makes this this piece. Um, more difficult uh, than one would think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a funny thing, and, and, and I still feel that, uh, even now, uh, after performing it many times, that you, you get on the stage, and it's not nearly as comfortable as you would hope. Yeah, that, that, right? That it had been, you know, at, at home. <laughs> well, I'm fascinated that you say that there are many places that um, are well written for the violin, because in the, you know, the unusual history of the origin of this piece, uh, the sort of un unfortunate history of how it started. Um, the original dedicatee, Leopold Auer, who was like the concertmaster of the Imperial Orchestra in St. Petersburg, and professor at the St. Petersburg Conservatory, and a close friend of Tchaikovsky and a supporter of Tchaikovsky's, he looked at it, it when Tchaikovsky first gave it to him, it was already like a printed copy. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, I, I wish you had consulted with me before you put it on to print, like on paper, he was sort of kind of rejected it and, and refused to play it and said that there were things that he just didn't feel comfortable with on the yeah. violin on it. It's so yeah. interesting that, and then he, of course, later he turned around and he, he ended up learning it and teaching it to his students and everything, but it's sad in a way that Tchaikovsky had, um, the same thing happened twice to him. He, earlier, he wrote a piano concerto mm -hmm. and presented it to to some of his like friends and professors at the conservatory, and they said that it was oh, just un, you know, it's just horrible. It was, maybe we can sort of, you know, make a couple parts of it uh, better if we do a lot of changes. And and Tchaikovsky was so hurt, and he's like, I will not change a single note. And he was really upset, and it really, but it really affected him. But he had, he had said he wouldn't change a single note. Then fast forward, he does the same thing with his violin concerto, and the same response, like, it's unplayable, and I won't play it. He had to wait a couple years for it to be premiered in Vienna by a, a, a violinist who maybe was good, but maybe not at, at the level, and then the orchestra was not great, and so then it was ripped apart by the critics. So poor Tchaikovsky, this piece had a really rough start. And then and it's fascinating to hear you say how well it's, in a ways, it's many, it, it, it is violinistic. He, he had a violinist help him write it. We should talk about that story too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it is amazing these stories that you hear of kind of what we know or what we think of as the, the greatest composers, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and and they're kind of, when we hear them in, in this day and age, they're undeniably just, it's great music and it's easy to understand and it brings great joy to us. But it's, 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 and it's hard to, it's, it's kind of mind boggling that at the time, uh, their contemporaries or the contemporary audiences, not all, not everybody thought so about, about this music. They thought it was even Mozart. And you think like Mozart to us is, to most of us is is something that we've grown up with, um, but at the time when uh, often after Mozart premiered his works, people would, would would actually say that it was kind of unintelligible. You know that this was very difficult to understand yeah. music and very complex, and it kind of just goes to show. And this exists today, of course, with all sorts of stuff, with with uh, whether it's. Uh, uh, Music or technology or other forms of art. There's there's things that that are presented to us that seem unintelligible, um, and hopefully we kind of grow to understand them later. Yeah. But but it, anyways, yeah. I mean Tchaikovsky, the, this concerto and the piano concerto. I mean, it's crazy that you would think that people would be like, I, I, I don't know about this piece. You know, <laughs> so I'm not great. sure. Um, yeah. And and. Um, but he did, uh, so this Leopold Auer, this you know, world famous violinist who it was dedicated to, basically rejected the thing and he, and he said, you know what, it's, it's unplayable and, and it's not written very well for the violin, I think, and, and it's technically too difficult. Um, and so he, he rejected it, which, which was just crazy because it's, it's not, it, it is written quite well. And, and yeah. he did, Tchaikovsky had a, a friend, 
um, a friend who was maybe more than a friend, um, help him write it. And Joseph Kotek? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Joseph, uh, was it Kotek? Yeah. Kotek. Kotek, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, who we, you know, researched probably shows now that the, that was actually one of one of Tchaikovsky's lovers. And, um, and they spent time and, and he, he helped him write it. And so when you have a violinist uh, with you and advising you, um, because Tchaikovsky himself was, was not a violinist, so, so often composers will look to, um, will develop a relationship uh, with an instrumentalist who knows the, the instrument inside out so that the composer isn't kind of inadvertently writing stuff that is kind of not really possible for the instrument. If you don't know the instrument inside out, you can accidentally, the composer can accidentally write something that's too difficult or actually literally impossible. And that's, so that's why you always need this kind of advice. The composers generally sought out advice. And so, so he had this advice, and, and from, from, a, from a very, from an excellent violinist, and yet, you know, yeah. when it was dedicated to our the other violinist, he said, "No, I, I can't do it." And, yeah. and he actually, our then actually wrote, kind of, uh, uh, he wrote, uh, he did a few things, right? Yeah. He, he he wrote separate optional violin parts to Tchaikovsky's part. Yeah. He edited actually, it. Yeah, yeah. He, he edited it. He he yeah. made ed edits to Tchaikovsky's music, you know, which is crazy. Yeah. And and in fact, some of the stuff that our wrote was more difficult than. It's what Tchaikovsky so crazy. Wrote. Yeah. That, and he made cuts, you know, which yeah. is unimaginable. He's like, you know, this is this goes on for way too long. You know, we're gonna cut this, and, and you know, you've you've done this too many times. We're gonna cut this, and it just it was imaginable that this 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 you know violinist was kind of trying to change Tchaikovsky. Yeah. And you might wonder, well, if if Joseph Kotek helped him write it, was so close to Tchaikovsky, and and you know they had a really special bond, why wasn't he the dedicatee? You might wonder. Well, the dedication of a piece like this is a very public thing. It's a very almost public statement, uh, and, and obviously Tchaikovsky's relationship with Joseph Kotek had to be completely like sort of secret and hidden at that time. I mean, it was not possible to be. You know, uh, outwardly homosexual or anything like that at that time. Um, in fact, Joseph Kotek, we don't know that he actually ever played it, and he did died young. Um, and um, but it's it's interesting that uh, from the beginning, Leopold Auer, this distinguished older um, you know pedagogue and concertmaster of the Imperial Orchestra, was the dedicatee, probably to help get the piece performed and to be, have it performed by a high level violinist. Um, and and Auer was a, also kind of a supporter of Tchaikovsky and his symphonies. He said, you know, I'm a big fan of his symphonies. I just don't feel like this concerto is up to that level. And, you know, he kept criticizing it. And, and then eventually he did turn around, like years later, long after Tchaikovsky died. Although he said that uh, when Tchaikovsky, just before he died, he asked for forgiveness. So that's an interesting little side chapter of, or end footnote of the story. Well, I think it had already become quite a hit, yeah. right? And, and then uh, uh, Leopold Auer kind of realized the error of his yeah. ways and realized, oh, man, I should have been there to hear yeah. this thing. And because this was written in like 1877, 1878, maybe premiered in 1880 like or so. Tchaikovsky died in 1893. So just in those 13 years or so, the piece had already been like embraced. And you had also said something earlier that, you know, we often hear about the official like history of these pieces coming down from critics. But what did the audiences think? At the first performance of this piece, there was probably audiences who loved it. Because all audiences do. But we get to hear from these like supposed critics, like experts, um, and they rip things apart, new, new music. They're, you know, a lot of them have more conservative tastes or whatever. And that's what happened with this very famous Viennese critic, Edward Hanslick who called it like, you know, like a boorish Russian, brutal, drunken thing. He, he literally used those words. He was like, the finale, it's like you're a drunken, he's, he's, like, he's attacking the violin, it's horrible. All these things really hurt Tchaikovsky's feelings, but the, you know, the public knows best, and these critics don't have all the answers. And the piece was quickly, I think, embraced by violinists and the general public. Anything you want to add on that? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> it's just interesting. I think in those days, uh, the critics had like a, a lot of power, yeah. uh, a lot of influence, and they really could sway um, 
people one way or the other, and, and people would believe, believe it, you know? And um, thank God that's not really true anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, 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 now everybody's a critic. Now so, everybody's a critic. So, uh, you, know, you could probably just write a Google review and, uh, yeah. and uh, get your 4.5 stars. And <laughs> exactly. Would you mind getting your instrument out and demonstrating some of this for us, please? That would be great. Yay. Yes. One an interesting thing about this concerto also is that Tchaikovsky, unlike with his first piano concerto, when the criticisms that came, he said, I will not change a note. In this one, shortly after, uh, even in the process of it sort of being developed, before the world premiere, Tchaikovsky decided to change the middle movement. He himself decided to make this change. So he wrote um, a, a, a new middle movement, what's called Canzonetta, a really wonderful little title, like a small song. Um, and he wrote it rather quickly. And it was to replace a, the movement that was there. And we think that it was maybe it was um, to make it just a little bit less substantial, um, a little bit, maybe a little bit more of a break for the violinist. Um, he did reuse that piece. It's part of a piece of his called the souvenir of a, a dear uh, one in the distance, or souvenir de le cher. You would probably say it better. I don't know. Um, but uh, so we know what that piece is like. But it's it's um, it's a, it, it's interesting that he himself rethought that middle movement, and and um, it is a special part too. But we don't want to jump ahead. We want to start with maybe the first movement. Before we play, could you tell them about your bio? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, tell uh, us about your instrument. So the the, yeah, the question is uh, just to mention my instrument. Um, it's a uh, old Italian violin. Um, it's not a Stradivarius, unfortunately. Um, I would be retired. If <laughs> uh, so um, this is a. The, a matron whose name is Giuseppe Cerruti, and this violin was made in 1810. It is it is from the lineage it is from the lineage of Stradivarius. It was made in Cremona, which is where Stradivarius worked, um, and the Stradivarius's one of his most famous pupils was Lorenzo Storioni, who then taught the father of Cerruti, my my Cerruti. So there's kind of a lineage in making that's that's the claim to fame as a yeah, yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. 1810. That's incredible. Do you know any of the previous violinists that have played it? I don't. No, I don't. Yeah. But yeah, that's an, it was made before the Tchaikovsky concerto was. Yeah, long uh, before. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, incredible. Yeah. So I, I have had it since I was 14. You've yeah. had it since yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. We'll, we'll never be able to afford it today. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, as because as, as you probably, most of you know, I mean, um, Italian violins, in particularly, uh, have uh, you know over the last twenty years have just skyrocketed in, in value, and so that's why literally you know Stradivarius violins are uh, start in the millions. You know I don't know the the, the least of two, how do you two or three million. Plane? How do you bring it by plane? Sorry. How do you protect it bringing it by plane? Well, okay. Oh, how do you protect it on a plane? Well, you make sure it stays very, very close to you all the time. Yeah. And uh, don't let anybody else touch it. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, do you mind playing a little bit of the first movement for us, sure. or anything else you'd like yeah. to? Yeah, well, I, I could just, yeah. I'll just play the beginning of the first movement. Sure. It's just the, the theme, and, and it's, uh, it's one of my favorite parts. Yeah. It's so beautiful. <clears throat>
Would you mind playing that part in the first one where it's um, <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? There's, uh, this is maybe one of the parts that might have been considered difficult or unplayable by our, perhaps. Sure. I don't know. Sure. And there so, are other things, too. So, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's basically, um, uh, it's, it's, what I, it's, it's, a, it's a version of what I've just played, mm -hmm. uh, the, the main theme, uh, but he's now kind of done a variation on it, and, and uh, it's much more technical. <laughs> In, in many concertos, you have a, a part where the soloist performs by themselves and improvises on the themes, what's known as the cadenza, right? And um, in this one, Tchaikovsky wrote the cadenza out himself, I'm sure with the help of Josef Kotek, and it sort of bridges uh, into the recapitulation, perhaps inspired by Mendelssohn. Um, and it has its own special challenges, and some parts that I think are you know, also probably pretty challenging and difficult, um, but really utilizing the violin in a brilliant way, like really um, focus, it, it does seem very violinistic, you know, it's like there's a lot that you do with your open E and the harmonics on that string and things like that, that are great. Anything you want to mention about the cadenza? Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Uh, this was, um, I mean, often, uh, in, in, for example, the days of the earlier concertos, like Mozart concertos, um, often the, the, the soloist was expected to write their own cadenza or, or maybe improvise a cadenza on the spot, and that was kind of um, a standard thing um, that, that uh, musicians would be well versed in. But then as we moved into the, you know, kind of the more romantic era, um, composers like Mendelssohn, like Tchaikovsky, they would uh, they would actually write in uh, and compose a cadenza. So it's kind of almost like a composed improvisation, and uh, so that's what Tchaikovsky did. And, and and it's you know and it's a treasure every time we have composers who did this because you get to for me at least you, you get to really hear what they would have done. Um, and what would have, would have been in exactly in the style of of that time, and it fits. Of course, it's written by him, so it fits the, the concerto perfectly. You, you you can't even imagine that um, this was something that that somebody could play something different. Yeah, at that time. I mean, when Tchaikovsky writes his own cadenza for the concerto, no one would think of writing a new one, <laughs> a different one. Yeah, exactly. And, and then so in the second movement, this little canzonetta that was added later, um, we have a very different kind of persona in the violin. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of swooning and romanticism in the first movement. There's a lot of virtuosity. And here it's almost like a gypsy quality or perhaps a Russian folk quality. Tell us a little bit about that. You get to explore more of like the lower strings of the violin and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, there is a kind of a folk, folk kind of quality and it's a, it's uh, more subdued, and it's uh, it's uh, there's a little bit of sorrow and a bit of a lament in there. Um, and interestingly enough, um, Tchaikovsky asked, uh, I think, to to make this effect uh, greater. What he asked for the violin to play uh, with a, with a mute. So, um, and I can just quickly demonstrate that. So, a mute uh, essentially changes the. The um, the timbre or the sound of the of the instrument, and it also makes it quieter, and and so you immediately get a different effect from that. Um, I'll just I'll just demonstrate. Yeah. 
It's fascinating that you mention it too, because there's a concertmaster solo in the Shostakovich that's muted, uh, yeah, as exactly. similar as you know. Yeah, 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 right. So, so the mute wasn't just to make things softer; right. it would also give a, um, a different atmosphere and a different emotional quality to the to the sound. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So this is. I'll, I'll do this without mute first. <laughs> It's in the case. There we go. <laughs> That's actually this mute. This mute doesn't make the, the this mute's not making the biggest difference. I'm just for the sake of argument. I'm going to put on what we call practice. Oh mute. my! And, okay. again, and then you're going to see how muted things get. Yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah. So, so here's a. This is a big one here. <laughs> Very different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the only the only thing is that I'm not going to use the mute at the concert. <laughs> <laughs> after, after having said all that, I, I mean, it it. Um, it's never done that way anymore. Uh, basically, not. I don't know if it's ever been done that way, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, on recordings, Sometimes, obviously, because yeah. you can, you know. But but the thing, the problem is, it it decreases the volume enough that with with today's modern orchestras yeah. and the the the, um, the the size and the the type of instruments which have changed since 1880, um, the orchestra plays much bigger and and the brass and winds the, the the sounds are louder so the violin doesn't cut cut through very well anymore when you put the mute in so it's a, it's a bit of a shame um, but yeah. you'd have to ask the entire orchestra to kind of play incredibly soft which is very difficult yeah right. And in the last movie, um, we have this kind of wild time. It, again, seems like we're, it's like a Russian folk dance. Uh, there are elements that sound almost like a, a hoedown, if you will, near the end. Um, tell us a little bit about it from your perspective as the soloist, this last moon, and what are you thinking of during this? And, and what, what kinds of images come to mind? Well, I'm mostly thinking about survival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a, it's not a ride in the park. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of it's a it's a very fast piece. It's a it's a lot of notes. Uh, this is just talking from violin violinistic per perspective. It's it's like a perpetual motion. Um, it's uh, it goes 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 and it's uh, it's the it's the fast it's the fast movement of the three, and um, it's a it's a real wild ride like yeah. you said and uh, and and it's also you know it's um to it's a it's a very challenging to uh, collaborate between the orchestra yeah. and and the soloist as well because it's got to fit together. Like like clockwork, or else if one one little thing falls off the edge, then yeah. everything everything falls apart. So it's it's uh, it's it's quite something to, it to kind of keep it going. But but it's it's a really fun movement. Like you said, it's got some folk kind of gypsy qualities almost mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. And that slower section that you yes. really love so yeah. much, it's yeah. kind of got this drone, dum dum yeah. dum, and again you have sort of a very Russian sounding yum bum ba da da dum da da da. da. So, but then it just gets right back to it, doesn't it? Sometimes it turns on a dime from this a slow part to suddenly fast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. coordinating that with the orchestra, the full orchestra being right there with you, split second, it can be a challenge. Yeah. 
any part of that you're willing to play, even the slow part or anything? <laughs> not, not right now. You're not warmed up, right? <laughs> that might be a bit dangerous. Okay, that's all right. No worries. Well, thank you so much, Terry. This has been fantastic. Thank you so thank much. You. We can't thank wait you. to hear you play it all. Yeah. And I've asked, I've, I've invited Terry to stay up here and, and uh, talk with me about the Shostakovich too. As a, Terry also has a multifaceted career, not only as a soloist and chamber musician, but he's also the concert master of the Victoria Sy Symphony. And in that role, he's played this Shostakovich Symphony and with other orchestras as well, frequently. Um, I think maybe even going back to when you were very young um, playing it. Um, and so, you know, it's fun to have uh, another perspective about this piece. Um, Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony is just one of the most incredible pieces um, uh, and was an important turning point in Shostakovich's life and in his music. Um, it was written at a specific time for a specific purpose, but yet it's become universal. Um, and people know anywhere can relate to its incredible intensity and emotions. Um, but it's interesting to know the backstory. Um, and I mean, it's Im important to know that at the time, Shostakovich was like a young celebrity composer in the Soviet Union. His opera, Lady Macbeth of the Men's, Men's, Men's District, uh, was playing for two years to great success. Um, and, but then one day, Stalin himself came to a performance of it. Now, Stalin was aware of Shostakovich before this. Shostakovich had written um, a number of patriotic pieces that sort of towed the party line officially in the Soviet Union prior to that. In fact, there was a song that was supposedly one of Stalin's favorite songs from a film that Shostakovich or, uh, wrote, the film score to. And so Shostakovich wrote this song that was a favorite song of Stalin's. So Stalin might have come into the opera thinking that it was going to be like that kind of music. But this was the Shostakovich that was the young rebel, maybe a little bit more out there, very avant-garde, also in terms of what was going on on the stage with actual murder and, and you know sexual things happening in the opera. That really offended Stalin. And so a day later or a couple days later, on the front page of like the most important newspaper, the Pravda, was this critique that many think that Stalin himself had a part in writing. Uh, and the title was Muddle instead of Music. And it just tore the music to shreds. And Given the, the purges that were happening at that time in the Soviet Union and the fact that Stalin was like systematically sending thousands of people to their death or to Siberia or you know, exile, including Shostakovich's own sister who was sent to exile, um, and many of his friends and, and colleagues who were like um, poets and playwrights and other people, they disappeared. Their lives were over. Um, so this was the, the kind of milieu, I guess, in which this critique in the front page of the newspaper almost was like a death sentence for Shostakovich. So how do you survive after that? And like I said, he was not an unknown composer. He was already kind of a celebrity even before that. He um, you know, made a huge splash with his first symphony when he was um, just barely maybe 20 years old, 19 years old. Um, and he was well known throughout not just the Soviet Union. Um, well, actually, yeah, that would have been the, the Soviet times but also internationally too. So here was an international uh, recognized composer that had this critique um, in this newspaper and, and how do you respond to that? What, what, how do you continue after that? Um, by the way, Terry, jump in at any time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Shostakovich knew he had to do something to get back into the good graces of the party line, literally to save himself. I mean, his life was actually literally on the line. What do you do in, in, for something like that? As I mentioned before, symphonies were very public kind of um, genres. Like the, the idea of a symphony was something that was not as like, um, like, for, like chamber music or a solo piano piece. It was a way to make a big public statement. So he, even though he was in the midst of writing his fourth symphony, which was very avant-garde and out there, he, he tabled that fourth symphony. He finished the fourth symphony and he put it in a desk. It was not premiered until many years later. He wrote, he started something fresh with the fifth symphony that he thought would help him live and appease those uh, critics and politicians, and but also amazingly express some real 
heartfelt and, and emotions and, and difficulties. So what the amazing thing is about this piece, and one of the many amazing things, is that it did sort of restore him into the good graces of the critics. It has enough triumph and, and splendor and exciting moments to do everything that Stalin and others kind of expected and wanted him to do. But it also has this incredible slow movement that's the heart of the piece, that's like openly instrumental weeping and sighing, which was really shocking at the time. In fact, the audiences at the first performance during that third movement, I mean, it was not even allowed to cry. You were not allowed to cry in public in the Soviet Union then, because that would be seen as, you know, we're all happy people, we're happy citizens, right? That was the top party line. So to be able to hear that so blatantly in a big public performance of, in the third movement, this weeping in the, in the orchestra made the people in the audience openly weep. It was almost like it gave them permission or it opened the floodgates or something. And they really responded, they understood. In fact, there's a lot of elements of that third movement that also had associations with the Russian requiem. So people were thinking already about loved ones who had passed or who had disappeared. And it, so it, it's incredible and courageous that when he was trying to write a symphony to put him back in the good graces of people like Stalin, he could put some music like that into this. And that's maybe why this symphony has such an incredibly broad appeal. It, it does appeal to that emotional side of us, and it also has the big, you know, triumphant parts of it that rouse us as well. I just you, you you can tell I love this piece, right? <laughs> uh, and I will say, you know, I got to conduct this piece as my audition concert for this job 25 years ago in 1999, and I thanks to this piece, I think I'm here with you today. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you. No, I don't. Thank you. That, but one of the reasons I mentioned that is that it was a piece that I had done a lot in my 20s and early 30s, and I've put it away for a long time. And I haven't conducted this piece for, I think, 15 years. So that I've changed a lot. And it's interesting because going back to it, this has been one of the hardest things to, for me to conduct this season. Even though I know the piece so well, I've conducted it so many times, but I'm trying to do it what, the way I would do it now. And I have to almost like throw away my old score and all those young markings of the young conductor and, and, and try to approach it differently. And it's a piece that has vastly different interpretations by different, compose, or different conductors. Um, and they all seem to have a sort of authority to many different conductors with a certain level of authority have even greatly different interpretations. So there's the, the wonderful cellist and conductor Rostropovich, who was a close friend of Stravinsky, or sorry, a close friend of Shostakovich's. And, um, and you know, he, he played a lot of Shostakovich's music on cello. He also conducted a lot of, you know, all of his symphonies. You hear a recording with Rostropovich conducting it, it has a certain authority. But there are things in, that he does that are not in the score. Um, and then you hear the conductor who conducted the first performance, um, Ravinsky, from the St. Petersburg Philharmonic, or Leningrad Philharmonic then. Um, and he not only did the first performance, but there are many other recordings of his over the years. And he did things very differently. And then comes along the American brash Leonard Bernstein. And in the 1950s, he took the New York Philharmonic daringly on tour to Moscow in the Soviet Union and played this piece in Moscow, in Tchaikovsky Hall in Moscow, with Shostakovich in the audience. And he had the chutzpah to take vastly different tempos than nobody else took. Super fast, very optimistic, very American. And Shostakovich came on stage afterward and took a bow and, and, a, and shook his hand. So, does that have Shostakovich's blessing? We don't know. There's all these different, it, there's, the clues in the score are ambiguous if at best. The tempo markings in the score are strange, the, especially for the very ending. There's a, a very kind of unplayable, ridiculous tempo marking that has had a storied history. People say, well, it was this. And then after Bernstein's, they change it to that. And then it's, it's changed to this, and now there's no real authoritative, real version of what the tempo mark should be. So, anything you want to add to this? <laughs> 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 
hard to follow that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I, you know, William has, has, has kind of shown how excited he is with his piece and how, how, how you all will be excited to hear it. Um, I, I just wanted to go back to, you know, maybe a slightly different take on it, or, or not take, but just um, just explore a little bit more. I, for, for most of my studies, I studied with a teacher from, from who emigrated from the Soviet Union and who also met Shostakovich. And so I, I got um, many stories and glimpses into what it was like to live in the Soviet Union. And um, it was very similar to what you're hearing from William about Shostakovich's life. I mean, he was basically constantly under pressure as, as a public figure and one of Russia's or Soviet Union's greatest composers to basically write music that celebrated the Communist Party. You know, that, that was really what they wanted. They were like, we want stuff, we want marches, we want loud, and we want stuff that makes the, the Communist Party look good. And so he he was he always had these this dual part uh, in his composing this kind of this kind of um, dichotomy or or kind of Jekyll and Hyde well, were you know where where he would try to write something that would please Stalin and the Communist Party but at the same time preserve his own inner kind of desire for for his own artistic voice. And he, um, and some, and you can hear this in his music. Sometimes you can hear his music is, you know, you can like, you can hear it and you can say, okay, that was just, just a party piece that was written just for politics, clearly. And then you can hear other pieces of his where, where you're like, hmm, this is, this is a bit. I'm not sure if this was kind of the real Shostakovich or the yeah. other Shostakovich. And in the Fifth Symphony, of course, he combines. He's able to do, and in, in some of his greatest works is where he kind of tricked. You know, where he tricked the authorities, the, the authorities yeah. into believing that this was a party piece, but actually he was able to express um, what was deepest uh, in his soul. Absolutely, yeah. And and you hear that it's not just in the third movement too. The first movement, this monumental, incredible first movement, has you know in a sense of like torment at the beginning and in a scared very first like you know reluctant first theme in, in the in the violins which will later come back in many different guises but very very different like you you have it first presented in violins very quietly timidly saying something that's that's like a sad theme basically and then it comes back later you'll hear in french horns going bum, 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 the same theme very low in a growly french horn and eventually through a buildup of an incredible buildup of, of dynamics and, and um, speed and more and more instruments joining the orchestra, a trumpet will say that theme in a like mocking, horrible way. Cha, 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 cha. It's like this incredible transformation of that music. It's, it's heart-wrenching, actually. So even in the first movement, you have um, a lot of that personal, like the maybe the real Shostakovich, if you will, like the stuff that he was able to to share and then in the second movement you have a sort of flip side this scherzo is a lot more glib uh it, it's lovely it has uh some lovely moments especially uh, nash has a wonderful solo in there um but uh it's also a, it, it's sort of like a parody of a waltz a kind of quasi waltz with a russian soul um, or Soviet soul, and but it's also a lot more like his film scores or the music that he wrote that was propaganda that had that sort of big sound for the authorities. Um, Will you tell, tell about just keeping a suitcase packed? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, actually, Shostakovich wasn't the only one, but um, a, a lot of people who were scared for their lives had a suitcase packed in case they were sent away. <laughs> Um, and so they, you just had to have that by your door in case they came for you in that big black car or van that would come take you away and from your family and friends and not to be seen from again. And so, yeah, he had to live with a, a suitcase packed by his door or in the stairwell outside um, for most of the rest of his life after this point in 1937. And he lived till 1975. A lot of his friends disappeared that way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's it's a scary, scary thing. Yeah, we're out of time. I'm, you know, it, 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 it's, it's like 
you know, I could go on and on about Shostakovich, but this has been so fun. I think you'll, you'll definitely appreciate this piece. And it's also an incredible tour de force for the orchestra. The instrumentation is amazing. The way he uses just like a, an occasional xylophone for a penetrating sound, or an occasional celeste for something ghostly and haunting and mysterious. Or the harps, there are two harps in, in this piece, and they're used to beautiful effect. Um, as I mentioned already, muted strings are called for at one point for a special effect. Divided strings that are divided in a special way with much more divisions that almost recall a Russian choir um, and, and help with that association with the Russian Requiem in the third movement. So much to tell you about this piece, but the main thing is just enjoy it. <laughs> it's been a great season. We're so grateful for your support of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra. It's going to be a fantastic concert weekend. Terry, thank you so much for being with us and really making a special. Have a good summer or spring if I don't see you. Summer and spring.